hello, this is Kevin, and thanks for coming back to Conversations with Kevin. Today, we have a special guest named Pete, who is a great man that I just met and already think that he's he's going to be a friend. Why do you think you think I'm great? We've only we've never met in person. I've been watching your your videos and I've been watching your your listening to your SoundCloud. And I think you're pretty cool. OK, thanks, buddy. And, Thank you, you know, in life, you know, like greatness is not a bad thing. Well, define greatness. But either way, I just try yeah. to be a good good human. That's to me. Yeah. Being, that's as great as you can get. Well, anyways, I mean, this is this is a this is an interesting uh, interview because we've just met. We met what two weeks ago, and I've been watching your videos, like I said. So I feel like I know you a bit. <laughs> Do you mean my, my YouTube channel? Like yeah, your YouTube channel, okay. and I've been listening right. to your your SoundCloud uh, clips, which uh, gives me a closer insight to your your humor and your sen your sense of humor and your personality. So Thank I you. do feel like I kind of know you a little bit. Okay, well that's fine. Fair enough. Fair enough. So that's why when I say great, I mean it's just you know. Okay, so, it's just it's a. A little embarrassing. That's all. That's okay. Well, hey, yeah. good. I embarrassed you on the top. That's that's right. nice. <laughs> so you're you're into radio now. That's interesting because I've always loved the idea. I, I'm a big radio fan, especially AM radio. I used to listen to Larry King live and uh, Art Bell and all that stuff. So I, I love AM radio. I love listening. Paul to Harvey. Do you remember Paul Harvey? Our, well, he was great. I mean, his little little snippets were awesome. The rest of the yeah. story. Yeah. Not now the rest. Oh yeah, that was great. So my, my first question is probably, you know, uh, you know, basic, but what got you into radio? When did you realize radio was something you wanted to do? It was, it wasn't something I wanted to do as a kid, uh, like as a little kid, although I used to tape songs off the radio and I used to call in for requests. I liked radio. I was a radio fan mm -hmm. uh, growing up in the island of Montreal. So it would have been CKGM AM and uh, Shome FM. And, uh, I guess when we moved to Ontario, when I was 16, uh, and I went into grade 12, there was a, uh, a high school radio station. I wanted to be on it. I just thought it'd be a fun, you know, I was interested in taking psychology. I was going to take something in the liberal arts in university. And then we moved to Ontario. I had two more years of high school. So uh, the radio station was there. I never got a show on uh, Arendelle secondary school radio in Mississauga though. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's okay. It sort of just inspired me more, I guess. So I went into Sheridan college in next door, Oakville, Ontario, uh and took a media arts program which was all kinds of things except radio it was tv production uh sound recording uh, a lot of photography film video multimedia they used to call it back in the early 80s mm -hmm. so it was everything but radio but there was an in-house college station radio sheridan at the oakville campus so i soon got a show there i became the music director there we had a it's kind of a free form college thing everybody had a different show it was fun i had a show uh and i enjoyed it um, awesome. but I wasn't getting anywhere with the media arts part. I wasn't a particularly good photographer. I wanted to get into the sound recording, uh, but for some reason I didn't. So after two years of a three-year program, I went to Fanshawe college in London and took strictly radio broadcasting there. Uh, so they divided it up. They had a radio, they had a broadcast journalism program. They had a TV program. They had a very famous sound recording program, audio engineering program, mm -hmm. uh, taught by the late uh, Jack Richardson, legend in Canadian music and music in general. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look him up, now his son is continuing the program at Fanshawe in London there. Anyway, just world-renowned uh, school for that and a pretty good school for radio. So uh, I had two years there. I got a job in April 86 in St. Catharines, Ontario. I started there uh at 23 and i've been doing it ever since with a few short breaks in there so i've been very lucky and this is only my fourth radio station in almost 38 years wow, so that that is something too because uh, a lot of people go do three times that sometimes i've been lucky i spent one i spent one long period at my last station in oshawa ontario i was there 27 and a bit years hmm. Yeah. What was your favorite stint in radio, if I may ask, like out of your career? I don't, I, I don't know. References, but like, where did you have a? I enjoyed in radio? when I got to Toronto at Country 59, which was an AM country station with a great signal. Uh, the Fan 590 Toronto occupies that signal now. Uh, I did overnights and I did production. Uh, I think I grew the most there. 
I don't know if it was my favorite stint. I, I was on the air overnight, so I was doing lots of phone calls and taping people. And back then you had to cut the tape. It wasn't like just take an Adobe audition and yeah. snipping that way. But anyway, uh, I took a lot of calls and I, I produced a couple of shows, i.e. put them together uh, with the music and the voice that had been recorded by the host. Or sometimes they were East Coast music shows that came in from Nova Scotia and PEI uh, that we aired on Sunday nights. And then it was just a matter of rolling the tape. Um, so I enjoyed that. I learned a lot and I was actually working simultaneously at Toronto's Harborfront center as an usher in the theaters there and, uh, having an overnight show sometimes then too, I was working two jobs cause I was living in Toronto at a friend's place. So, uh, that that's where I think I grew the most. I was around real professional Toronto, uh, caliber broadcasters, okay. uh, in terms of both the on-air people and the office staff and the new staff. Cause there were new staffs back then in 1994 so that's i think the period between 92 and 95 is where i learned the most and then i got settled in quite nicely in uh, oshawa at kx96 which was initially in ajax for the first nine years or so really clean uh, town from what i hear i'm sorry it's a really clean town from what i hear oshawa or oh, ajax. ajax you're making an ajax joke okay <laughs> it's a very important town during world war ii you can wikipedia yes. that if you like to anyway so you, you touched on uh, overnight radio taking calls. I I grew up, you know, since I was 10 years old, listening to AM, like, you know, the signal at night. You can get a station from Cleveland, New York, and all that. And sure. um, I, I, I love the calls. Do you have a call that you sticks out to in your mind on overnight radio that, you know, you can share? No, there were there were several regulars who would call in. There was yeah. a woman with a, and I never met any of these people. She had a, a slight Caribbean slash asian accent i i think she was filipino but grew up in in jamaica or uh antigua barbuda i don't know where uh but she call in very shy and she loved vince gill she loved his voice she loved him so much she could not say his name she'd call in we'd talk a bit and she'd say can you play the entertainer of the year and i said you want to hear some vince gill right because he was always entertainer of the year at the cmas back then and she'd go yes and she'd laugh because she couldn't say his name so that kind of uh, that and several other people who I'd meet DJing at the uh, country club in Toronto simultaneously, I was doing that too. Um, they they kind of taught me that uh, you shouldn't stereotype when it comes to a, a music genres listener, you know, uh, because we, you know, we'd have East Indian folks, folks from uh, that part of Asia, Southeast Asia, and uh, and all around the world, who you know, like Mary Chapin Carpenter and all these new acts that the, the early and mid '90s brought, to, like me in '92. That's when I became a big country music fan, right. uh, because there was, it was a boom back then. But it was it was great music too. And I don't want to sound like an old fart, but it was really good music, mm -hmm. not necessarily compared to now. It's just different now. Uh, yeah, and different. I'm older, and everybody likes stuff that reminds them of their past. You know, oh, yeah. the good past. Music so, is a time machine. Music is there. Yeah. It just takes you deeper than the sense of smell in your brain. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I, I, I'm a passionate person when it comes to music. It's it's uh, it's been in, in my life, well, all my life, really, even since I was a kid when I got my first Rene Simard record. And my ah, Rene Simard. Are you French? <laughs> I'm half French, half English. So whereabouts in, were you in Quebec? Yeah, I'm in the Montreal area. I was right. born in La Salle, raised La Salle. in Laval de Rapide, and now I live in Hudson. So I've, I've been around the whole area from, uh, you know, semi-city to full country. Okay. You know, what's funny is because I moved before I got my driver's license, I didn't explore the West Island and we always took transit downtown or got a lift or whatever. Yeah. So I never got to know the area by driving until I moved to Ontario again. And we had moved between Ontario and Quebec twice. Uh, I lived in Point Claire from the time I was about one till I was four. Okay. We moved to Whitby and Oshawa, which are side by side, east of Toronto. We moved to Whitby and Oshawa for a couple of years. Then we moved to Dorval, not far from where we lived when we lived in Point Claire. Yeah. And that's where I spent 10 years in the 1970s. And then when I was 16, we moved back to Ontario to Mississauga. So I've, I've been in Ontario for you know, 40 years before I moved here to New Brunswick a couple of years ago. So hmm. I still feel like a Quebecer at heart. And I know Hudson a little bit from friends in St. Lazare who took me to this pub there. Oh, I'm moving to St. Lazare uh, this month. I mean, that by the end of the month, I'll be living in St. Lazare. Okay. Well, if you're not too obnoxious, I'll give you my buddy Craig's phone number. 
Well, we'll see by the end of the interview if you think I'm a grouch uh, or not. Okay. <laughs> well, you're not. I'm just making a joke. So, okay. So, I I got a very uh, interesting question as far as my my interest in radio is. Who was your favorite guest that you ever interviewed? I'm sure you must have done some interviews on the radio. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, and I say favorite. About... I know it's hard to say favorite, but what what stands out in your mind as an interview? There's been so many great great memories and not necessarily interviews either just experiences and yeah. time spent with songwriters and, and guitar players and singers you know um i've gotten to, i've been very lucky to meet some pretty big names in the country music and outside of country too you know just mm-hmm. incidentally um so you know i don't have nec- I some interviewees are easier to talk to than others mm-hmm. um some i made friends with because they were local ontario musicians who've come up and become Pretty okay. so a lot of the Canadian country names I I guess I'm friendly with but mm-hmm. uh, and that's been nice it's just I, I like songwriters and I like players so uh, to hang out with Keith Urban not once or twice but three or four times and have him remember me yeah. and pick up conversation I mean that was something because I just respect that guy so much I don't love every song he does mm-hmm. but I'm a fan I've seen him live several times and I tell you dollar for dollar you're not going to get more bang for your buck uh, seeing a Keith Urban concert so to hang out with him a little bit. And, uh, and I guess the biggest, uh, experience I got to like the most memorable one so far, uh, it was 2016, summer 2016, we were in Quebec city, <clears throat> excuse me, at the festival de Tay. And, uh, it's funny that we'd wanted to go for the beginning of the festival, but time and logistics didn't work out. It's a, it's a big, long nine, 10 day music festival, similar to the Ottawa blues fest, but yeah. on the plains of Abraham and eight or nine other locations around town awesome location. uh, and a lot of free music as well. But that show I think opened with sting and Peter Gabriel the first night on the big stage. And we couldn't go there for that, but we went the following week uh, and we got to see Selena Gomez and, Roxy mm-hmm. Music. I'm sorry, Brian Ferry, uh, doing mm-hmm. a lot of Roxy Music music. Uh, and uh, Country Acts as well. I'm trying to remember. Oh, yeah. Cheryl Crow was there. But the big thing was we had contacted our record label <coughs> rep in the in Montreal to hook us up with the guy in Quebec City to see if he could get us, you know, side stage or whatever, or just better. You know, we had general admission. We had the basic wristband. Yeah. And sure enough, I met up with uh, Stefan Drolet and he was great. And he gave us these passes. We were uh, side stage, you know, sort of the VIP area, still paying for our beers, but a lovely mm-hmm. summer evening. And we'd seen uh, uh, um, Neil Finn was a real highlight of that concert, oh, yeah. by the way. Yeah, he was awesome live. Um but yes, getting back to Brad Paisley. So Cheryl Crow was doing her set and we were down uh, in the VIP ish area side stage, not too far back. Cause the Plains of Abraham is huge. Yeah. They got audiences, 70, 80,000. Awesome. So uh, Brad Paisley was on after Cheryl Crow and Stefan came out and hung out with us and said, listen, we're going to go backstage. So I thought, Oh, we're going to watch from side stage, you know? Wow. Very cool. We'll see this huge crowd out there and watch Brad. And we mm-hmm. won't hear very well because we're not anywhere near the speakers or yeah. Anyway, it's a terrible sound on stage unless you have monitors or in-ears. So, no, they escorted us onto the back of the stage, past where the video production guy was with all his screens and his mice and his keyboards and producing all the video that's going out there. And we come up. Brad Paisley sets up these bars on stage, depending on the size of the stage. He's got one at each side. They're fake bars with people serving light beer. And it's record label friends, band friends, probably, I don't know, contest winners, Mm-hmm. Uh, people who get to go, there's five or six, eight, seven, eight people at each bar. And we were the four of the people on stage left. Wow! And so we, <laughs> we drank light beer and uh, stood behind Brad Paisley's fiddle player while he did an amazing set about an hour and a half mm-hmm. before 60, 70, 80,000 fans. Awesome. And people come to the festival day take from all over from, from yeah. Vermont, New Hampshire, from Maine, uh, probably from, you know, New York, certainly yeah. Montreal, <laughs> Quebec City, New Brunswick, I'm sure. There were people there from Edmonston or even uh, Fredericton, maybe. It's not that far a drive. So uh, that was amazing. Just, you know, we were looking at the set list. And mm-hmm. again, the sound was terrible, but the crowd loved it. And, yeah. you know, 
we were sitting there drinking light beer. We'd had so many regular beers before we were up there because I wasn't working. We were just partying, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that I actually kind of drank myself sober during Brad Paisley said. <laughs> yeah, I've been there. I've done that. <laughs> that was my first and only time. It's quite anyway, so that was an amazing, amazing experience. Yeah, and we love Quebec City anyway. So it was part of a great week. Oh, it's a beautiful city. It's the oldest city in North America. Did you know that? It certainly is. And and here's one other thing that was a kind of a neat trivia thing. The week before we were due to go there and see Neil Finn and Brian Ferry and Selena Gomez and um, who's that girl from Brampton? Uh, Alessia, not Alessia Cara. Yeah, I think I know what you mean. Uh, anyway, she's awesome. And she was having her birthday that night. She opened for uh, Selena Gomez. Mm -hmm. And it was her birthday, and she mentioned how she was here when she was 12 on the Plains of Abraham for a school tour on her birthday. And she said, wow, here I'm 21 tonight. That was a very cool moment. But anyway, getting back to my original story, um, the week before we left for FEQ, we saw Keith Urban at the amphitheater in Toronto on the lakeshore there. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we got to hang out with him backstage. Now, this is probably my, I'm not bragging here. But this was probably my fifth or sixth time meeting Keith. So we were quite comfortable by then. And I had mentioned uh, that we were going to see uh, Neil Finn next week because Neil is also New Zealand, Australian. And uh, we were going to go see Neil Finn from Crowded House and Split Ends, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he said he looked at me and he said he sang at my wedding. Now, we weren't being I didn't have any microphones out. I wasn't recording anything for the radio. It was just talking to him. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, wow, so cool. And he was talking about with Nicole, Nicole Kidman. And you never talk to him about his wife. You let him bring his personal life up if he wants to. Yeah. Although, you know, even right. even off, you know, off the record. This is the way I was with him. Mm -hmm. So uh, he said he sang at my wedding. And I said, oh, really? What song? And he said, fall at your feet. And I said, that's so cool. And he went, yeah, it was great. Mm -hmm. And I looked it up later. And Keith had a bunch of singers at his wedding. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, there's the, the fact that he did. And why would Keith lie to me, you know, about Neil Finn singing at his wedding? So when Neil did that song on the Plains of Abraham uh, at the FEQ, uh, I thought of that story. I thought, that's so cool. I said to my wife, Jen, who's next to me. Anyway. That's awesome. That's uh, a great venue and it's a great festival. I mean, they've, they've had even acts like Metallica and Roger Waters. Uh, yes, major, Arnold major Stone. acts. Yeah. One of our first trips to Quebec City before we even knew about the festival they take. Um, we, Jen and I were up at the top of the plains uh, getting an ice cream after you do that long, long walk along the uh, promenade. And uh, we looked down, we saw them building this huge stage. And so this would have been a week before what would have been the FEQ for that year. And that was there, I think, uh, was it Gaga? No, it might have been Madonna. Anyway, it was pretty big. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how we've kind of found out about it a little bit. We started going to Quebec City more often. So, yeah, I haven't been to that festival yet, but I, I, I regret not seeing the Roger Rodgers show because that was his final show of the Wall Tour, which was which I seen twice on that tour. I seen it came to Montreal twice. I saw it both times. Really, it was an amazing tour. Yeah, did not know that. It's a it's a it's a it's an event. It's not a concert. It's, it's sure. I mean, he no. builds a wall while he's they're building yeah. a wall while he's singing, and it crumbles down. It's just uh, my friend Gary saw. He actually was such a fan. He went to uh, Long Island to see the original Wall Tour in nineteen eighty. Wow. Yeah, anyone yeah. so the original pink floyd obviously all it's when they weren't talking to each other <laughs> yeah. They, yeah. they used to set up their trailers around the venue so that they wouldn't see each other so and the, the route uh -huh. to the stage was so that they couldn't see each other until they got on stage that was how bad it was that awful it's i did sad. get to see them at um in 77 at olympic stadium in montreal yeah, but, uh, i was way up in the nose bleeds that, that was, was the uh in, that was the inspiration for the, the turning point yeah, that's what created the wall is when he got mad. Well, no. it's sort of, yeah, it, it was part of the impetus. Some fans were throwing firecrackers or something, yeah, and yeah, yeah. he stopped and bawled them out. And Yeah. I had I heard the recording of the bootleg of that. Yeah, scene. it's out there. Yeah. We were there. I was 14. Wow. Way up in the rafters in the 700s. Yeah. Our the common 700. friend James was there, too. He talks about that concert. James Olmstead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think James and I were sitting together. Oh, cool. So oh, that's crap. that's that's really cool. I believe we were there together. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, and I have the same birthday as David Gilmore, so and it's next week. So don't. How did that anything. feel to be at the, the that you know epic concert in Montreal? Like that's that's one of the concerts oh, I, that Floyd talks about. It's, I, it's, it's funny. I have very little memory of the sound of the show, just the yeah. experience, and little because it was so long ago. Mm -hmm. Um, 
any, but even for years after, I remember the guy, there was a guy who climbed up on the, uh, the roof. They hadn't filled in the hole of the roof because the stadium was only a year old. And uh, some guy had gotten up onto the top and everyone was looking at him. And the inflatable pig was only half inflated. That was a little disappointing, but mm -hmm. we were there for the music. I remember some things about just the sound was terrible. Stadium concerts are awful for sound oh, outdoors. Especially back then. And arenas too, especially back then. Yeah. No, uh, like and I couldn't, sounds great. I couldn't see the band and there were no cameras on the band showing them on video screens yeah. back then. They did have video screens, but they were just showing really neat, trippy kind of welcome to the machine stuff, you know, animation. Oh, that was very stuff. cool. Yeah. They opened with, was it welcome to the machine or shine on you? I think they opened with welcome to the machine. That's really cool. That, that, I, can't I was remember. just a little too young. I was uh, 77. Yeah. I was 11 years old. Well, there you go. I wasn't much older. So I think that was one of my, it was like I my third show. Show concerts. I wish I would have saw, but uh, yeah. my first concert was April wine at the Montreal forum in 1979, 1980, something. Like nice. That. They used to play uh, La Ronde. They used to play uh, man in his yeah. world. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, Brian uh, Moffat was no, or was it Brian Green? No, Moffat Brian I think was the sound guy at uh our show when brian adams played at our school <laughs> in high school yeah. nice yeah i yeah. i yeah it, it, they live around here i've met these guys the, the, the mm -hmm. chateau next door and you know mm -hmm. conversations with the guys that i considered rock stars when i was young you know mm -hmm. and still are but i mean you know not, not yeah touring way as they used to but yeah, yeah they used to fill up arenas and stuff like that they had a great career at that point in the late 70s and early 80s it was awesome yeah, for sure. We had Max Webster, <clears throat> excuse me, and Saga play our high school in Mississauga. Yeah, I, seen Max. No, no, no. I saw Max open for Peter Gabriel at the Montreal Forum, mm. and they were virtually unknown in Quebec at that time. And I think only kind of culty in uh, Ontario, although it was the high class in Borough Choose Up. So maybe they were a little bigger than that by then in Ontario. Mm. I don't know. So what was your first concert? First concert was Chicago. Oh my God! That must at the Montreal Forum, yeah, it was uh, right around. If you leave me now, mm. take away their greatest hits album. I wore it out. I just well, you know, Chicago got a lot of flack in the '80s, and rightly so because ah, what David Foster, who I really respect, but I just it wasn't my cup of tea for the music. Even though I was working at a radio station that basically played that stuff, yeah. but to me, the Chicago their run of hits and even their non-hits, especially their non-hits. In the 70s, the early is from 69 to 75, 76, 77, right up to if you leave me now. <laughs> so you must uh, have had music that you had to play that you're just really. Oh, just well, that's it, it's, that's broadcasting. You're not yeah, out there spinning. Hey, here's another favorite of mine, you know? Yeah, yeah. Because so. that's the work thing. Like, you know, people say, like, okay, being a musician or being a radio radio host or like it's, it's glamorous and all that. But there's stuff that's actually work in the sense that having to listen to that song every day that you don't like. That's work. You know, there's a lot worse jobs. Oh and I try not to ever complain uh, because uh, I know that, you know, and I don't know what else I would do. So any minor inconvenience or tech, there's a lot of technical things sometimes that go wrong on my part or something I can't help. Mm -hmm. um, in the greater scheme of things, man, I'm playing music and talking and whether yeah. I like, I like to like the music. And when I play a song, I like, I crank up my headphones or turn it up in the studio, you know, um, but it, it's not a priority, you know, I, everyone in college wanted to work at a rock station or a top 40 station. And I was like, yeah. I don't want to work top 40. And I don't know if I can be a rock guy, you yeah. know, Somebody actually told me back then, he'd probably be all right on country radio. I had a very light voice for a 23-year-old. I wasn't going to get a job in a major market right away. Mm -hmm. It's taken years of drinking and smoking to get this. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, conditioning. I call that working. You know. Conditioning, sure. Uh, aging like a, an oak cask. Yeah. Um, but I, I didn't have the obvious, you know, and for me to go as a 23-year-old, to work at it. it was basically a music of your life station that was a popular format in the 70s and 80s it was very mor so mm -hmm. it was like 
uh, CHFI was prior to about 86 or 87, just soft hits and occasionally in the evening, instrumental versions of those hits, you know? Like Q92 was in Montreal. I guess so, wherever, yeah, every market had them in the Q or back in the day. So we were kind of like that. We did play some interesting instrumental music, which was sort of like light, the precursor of smooth jazz. You know, you had classical guitar player like Earl Clue. We played a lot of him, Lee Rittenauer, the guitar player. So these are like jazz cats or... They just made smooth sounding music back then, ahead of smooth jazz. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe they were the Little Richard and uh, Elvis of, and Chuck Berry of smooth jazz. But anyway, we played this stuff, and I actually was interested in that kind of music. But but yeah, the rest of it, there were some 70s hits we played. You know, we play uh, Seals and Crofts and Loggins yeah. and Messina and, of course, some Beatles back then, too. So it wasn't all terrible, and you just get used to that. And even in my current uh, radio station our currents i.e our top five powers play every two and a half hours okay. and that will burn you out on yeah. those songs even if you like them yeah. and it won't be a case of if you didn't like them you'll learn to like them later because you're playing them that that often but the country station i was at before that the top currents were every four hours mm-hmm. which even then seems a lot to some people but th- that's the irony is the longer you listen the more you're going to hear them that's right and once upon a time radio concentrated on getting hours tuned they wanted the most uh, so it behooved them to have a wider musical universe mm-hmm. uh to get those hours tuned and country listeners especially country music back then anyway were very loyal um to their country station they didn't generally listen to other stations and if they did they would be a rock station or a talk station and so uh that was the goal back then rather than get an average quarter a high average quarter hour audience which is your other measurement they wanted the cume you know they wanted the the big the big uh, hours tuned and the cume Mm -hmm. but anyway um so the more often you play those songs the less people are going to listen but more people are going to listen because they know they're going to hear that song it sort of works out that way so it's a trade-off and you know i learned very early in my 38 years that uh all the uh the idealist i was when i got into the industry became a realist quite quickly Mm -hmm. because you realize you are broadcasting and yes to a certain extent if you want to be cynical it's a lowest common denominator i.e it's about getting numbers it's about getting listeners to hear our commercials and the songs are just in between the commercials well yeah i've heard that said very many times and it is very cynical to say but that's the case we want ears Mm -hmm. and in my case as a listener you know i would love it if i have a station that could play iggy pop and then peter gabriel era genesis and then dwight yoakam and then some bulgarian folk singers that would be a great Pete station. And people can do that now with their Spotify's and their exactly. YouTube I was gonna and say everything else. That. So really, and that's kind of forced commercial radio, which is what we're in. It's commercial radio. It's about mm-hmm. making money. Exactly. In my case for Stingray, but in my own case for my old company and whomever, mm-hmm. that's what it's about. You know, <laughs> it kills me when people complain about radio because it's, it's free for one thing. So if yeah. you don't like something or they're playing this song too much, that's all you have to do, you know, and it's a shame if you do, but we're trying to get as many people listening as long as we can. Of course. Yeah. And we're not going to do that with Iggy Pop into the Bulgarian folk singers. That's right. Because, I mean, it's a business and the business yeah. is there to make money. And I always say and, that. People- and I wanted to work at the CBC where that kind of uh, restriction would, would there be different restrictions at the mm-hmm. CBC, obviously. But that's where I wanted to work for most of my, especially when I was unemployed for that year. Mm-hmm. I applied and applied and applied at the public broadcaster. And I think I really would have fit in well then, but anyway, Mm -hmm. (laughs) damn CBC. Yeah. Uh, So, you know, you learn very quickly if you want to be staying in the business, that it is a business first and you can have fun and, uh, you know, I'm on the air, but if I was, you know, a creative producer or a a copywriter, you know, it could be a different situation or a salesperson. Yeah. So exactly. I've just been allowed to do this for 38 years. Like that blows my mind. It's that is know, awesome. I'm a kid still, you know. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Right? What, what's your favorite time slot that you've done in, uh, in radio? Well, you know, m- middays is where I was most comfortable. That's I did okay. an afternoon show, I did a two to six, two to seven show uh, for many years. Mm-hmm. But midday is what I've done most of my life, which is 10 to two, sometimes 10 to three. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, because I think I've always 
before I came here and started doing this morning show, I've always seen myself as sort of a background guy, meaning I'm there in the midday show. You're there to play music. People are listening in the office or the car or hopefully at home or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just, I, I always kept things short. I was only on twice an hour. Well, twice of any length an hour i'd come in with little quick ids and mm -hmm. information but i only had two minute minute and a half breaks an hour and that's where i showed my personality but it wasn't you know i'm always been a guy next door i'm not i was never a comedian sort of thing so yeah. a guy next a door was a bit of quirk, quirky but but yeah. so the midday show was good for me uh, it's been being on the morning show where i have to talk a lot more and do a lot more content and plan things out and i'm still getting there <laughs> i'm still learning which is great you know because uh, i'm an old dog learning new tricks here and i love that too so um and i love being here in fredericton new brunswick's beautiful really yeah beautiful gorgeous how, how's the experience as a morning show so far like how, how's that feel uh in in, in your career and compared to the rest of your career how does it feel it's a, been a total sea change for me the last 18 months, but that's for several reasons. The morning show specifically, I'm in bed at 7.30, 8, 8.30 every night, almost every night. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm up at 3.30, 3.45. Sometimes I'm up at 3 mm -hmm. and lying, you know, tossing. I don't want to miss my alarm, so I do that half in and out for 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. But I'm usually out the door by 4.30 and into the station by quarter two. It's whoops. I uh, have a fairly short drive to work. It's a straight shot for the most part and mm -hmm. if the weather's not too bad i can get there in 15 10 15 minutes and uh, i get in i start doing my prep we do little newscasts uh, every half hour starting at 6 a.m they're just very short broadcasts the fast five three news stories a couple of sports and the weather and that's it i'm done in a minute and a half hopefully uh, but i have to do six of those <laughs> uh, but not six different ones but you know what i mean we rotate them anyway um and it's a lot more local, obviously, and I'm getting to know the area. I've only been here 18 months, but yeah. my mother was from Woodstock, just down the road uh, from Fredericton. And uh, I'm closer to my cousins, which is really cool. Yeah. Uh, and we got great neighbors. We love our neighborhood. We love our house. That's I mean, I'm just, we're, my wife and I are pinching ourselves every day. Is everything perfect here? No. New Brunswick's got its uh, growing pains mostly because of a, a big exodus from the rest of the country. So mm. we'll see. And morning shows are very um, personal for a lot of people. That's their morning routine. That's what they, they did. It's the background of their morning routine, getting ready, going to work, driving to work, stuck in traffic. Yes. And also so, that morning time at work where you're decompressing, having your first, second, third coffee. And what you do is provide them with their, their, you're like the company they have, you know, they're, you're somebody that keeps them company. Yes. How does it, that it, feel? And it's a different, that you're doing that. It's a different kind of audience than I would have had in the midday show, mm -hmm. um, which again, we were more of a background uh, thing back then, mm -hmm. but now I'm foreground and people are in their cars and they're hearing every mistake I make. Or <laughs> if I leave my mic up, which I've done a few times, and this is a oh, reminder yeah. to all broadcasters, any future broadcasters, moment. never, ever swear in the control room. doesn't mm -hmm. matter if you think the mic's on or off, just don't swear in your control room or yeah. say anything, anything that could be remotely taken the wrong way. Yeah. Because the, it's been a different board. There's been some different technology for me here. Now, I've been here 18 months, so I shouldn't be leaving my mic up anymore. I should, And I mostly am not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, um, What's the most embarrassing thing you say with your mic on? Uh, I'll tell you this, because I've only had four radio stations I've worked at in my whole life. Mm -hmm. The only time I've ever accidentally said the station before is called Letters has been at this new place. Oh geez. I've come off songs. Um, and I haven't, to be fair, I haven't done it in a long time, but again, 18, the, the first couple of months, I think I did it twice, but it was always before 6am that 5:30 AM to 6am. My first half hour, mm. that's probably the most me you're going to hear all morning okay. because that's when I just, I've gotten in, I'm having my second coffee and I'm getting used to being there. I'm getting everything ready in my head. I know the weather. I know the traffic, the school. There's so much going on. And mm -hmm. I'm alone in the control room. I have no producer, no writer. It's just me and the mic and a couple of screens and I'm recording. Anyway, it's fun. It's been a great challenge, awesome. but it's fun. And I'm still having fun. And the main thing is keeping my energy up, you know, and getting a good night's sleep. That's what I'm finding the most important. 
Speaking but of anyway, call letters, one, one, tell, tell us uh, your station and how they can hear it online, because I'm sure some people might, after this interview, say, hey, this guy's cool. I want to hear him in the morning. <laughs> uh, okay, well, um, provided I'm still on the air at the time people are seeing this. <laughs> I'm sure you will be. Uh, you can find me. Okay, so we're on the Radio Player Canada app. The, the radio station is Fredericton's New Country 92.3. It's a Stingray radio station, part of the Stingray group. And uh, and so it's sort of programmed nationally. It's, it's a sort of a brand. The chain is New Country, and we're New Country 92.3. Fredericton's New Country 92.3. So we're online at newcountry92.3.com. We're on the Radio Player Canada app. You can get us on the iHeartRadio app. Uh, you can tune in on, did I say new country, 923.com? I did. Yes. New country, 923.com. <laughs> ASMR. Uh, creepy. <laughs> anyway, yeah, it does, does it? Sorry about that. You can edit it's okay, that. It's funny. No, it's funny. No uh, so yes, those, those three ways. And, um, oh, there's, a, oh, we have an app as well. There were, oh, there's two more apps, the Stingray music app, yeah. but I'd suggest you download the Fredericton's new country, 923 app. That app works pretty well. Cool. well that's uh, or new country, 923.com. It's funny since I've been here, my boss is, and I have a great boss. I don't want to go on too much about him, but boy, he's great. Yeah. And he showed me some of the streaming numbers. He's done this over the last 18 months, a couple of times. And like huge and in the morning show and i know that's because of my cousins in montreal and my friends in the toronto area okay and maybe some out west mm -hmm. and maybe a couple in australia my sister and brother-in-law sister-in-law and brother-in-law down in australia so that's what's happened there the broadcast numbers haven't been terrible i've held my own over the last two books uh ratings books we only get rated once a year uh but I've managed to hold my own. Obviously, we want to grow that anyway. That's that's the plan. So I've been the most thing important thing being here is integrating myself into the community, Kevin, mm -hmm. because as the morning show host and the existing morning show hosts on my competitors, including my brother competitor, Dave next door in the rewind studio, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, they're all really integrated into the community and they're doing morning show things. And we've all seen on Facebook or on socials, or you hear it on the air, mm -hmm. what a morning show in Canada does. And it's, of course, you're talking about the pop culture stuff and things that are trending and your TikToks. Mm -hmm. And you, in my case, country music artists, we have a Showtime report and that's giving you the latest news on country artists, et cetera. But yeah, and, and you're doing these lifestyle -y questions like, What's something your husband leaves around the house that you wish you would put away? And then they take calls about that. And I get all that. And I like all that, but it, it's not really me. So I've been adjusting to becoming sort of like that okay. but at the same time, keeping myself, I don't want to give them more of what they're already getting on mm -hmm. the other stations. I'm me. I'm going to be me anyway. And my boss understands that. Obviously, you know, he, he wants as much calls and, and listener involvement as we can do. And I'm, I'm trying to do that. And I think we're getting there. Uh, we need some more big prizes to give away. That's always a great incentive. But we got some really good loyal listeners. And boy, 98% of the people I talk to on the phone or I hear from by email or messaging, you know, 99 and a half percent have been super awesomely welcoming. Like Ooh. they're so nice here. There is a, a a small faction in the province that are sort of uh, against Eastern central Canadians coming here and, you know, driving up home prices. But uh, of course that's a double-edged thing because we're also bringing tax base and, yeah. and you know, where the province is growing where, you know, yeah. New Brunswick has kind of been stagnant for many years, but now Nova Scotia and people are discovering this, I guess that took the pandemic, but there has been an exodus here yeah. and there's probably some resentment on some smaller minded people who might not have ever been out of their little town. You know, New Brunswick's mostly rural. Yeah. I'm here in Fredericton, but that's a small city. You know, it's the third, third biggest in New Brunswick. So that should tell you something. So anyway, you mentioned your reach uh, through internet uh, streaming. Um, I, I have a lot of subscribers that are in Algeria. So you, you might be playing country music for Algerians in the near future. <laughs> Who knows? That's fine. Welcome one and all big 10. And, and that's big the fun ten. thing about YouTube is, is like, you know, well, I do do an RSS feed as well, which I actually have people in Europe and, and in uh, uh -huh. 
in the states that listen to the RSS feed. So it's it's kind of cool to have that that reach, and it's really cool that you know a, a guy like me who doesn't have a station to work with could actually do something. Whereas other people listening, and I, I kind of like I I envy your position because I've always thought that was be a really cool job to have. Well, two things about the streaming numbers, and yes, I was happy to see that, but I, I know it's my cousins and my friends. You know right. that that bump is going to show. Uh, but two things about it. For one thing, you know, they're listening, but our show is so hyper local in terms of news and, uh, traffic information, weather, uh, uh, goings on, you know, um, that I don't know what anyone in Algeria or Vancouver for that matter would, would get out of it other than the kick of the music and, and maybe oh. some of the, the, the bits we do. So, as a radio fan, I have to admit that I used to love listening to what's going on in Cleveland, what's going on in Chicago, yeah. these stations that I would listen to on AM. And I always thought their commercials and their local restaurant ads and all that and their local so, you know, plumber ads, I always thought they were interesting. So actually, it was entertaining because even though I wasn't from there, the commercials were fun. And then yes. back to the show and the show I liked yes. because it was about stuff I like. So I think it has a reach to people that are, are open minded to to different cultures and and, and different in areas of the world I, th I think it's really cool actually it's like you traveling without moving you know sorry i'm sorry it's for interrupting okay. you mentioned uh, listening at night to the ams and and i used to do this in the toronto area it's called skip uh when you hear a signal bounce it's right. usually off low level atmosphere clouds whatever mm -hmm. uh, and so you can get new york city at uh you know nine o'clock at night and hear the traffic uh, reports on the eight yeah. which was uh, really I think it was cool WCBS. Yeah. Pardon me. I used to love doing that. Like I said, I used to listen yeah. to. Uh, yeah. So that that's cool. I think you have to be a bit of a radio bug to want to do that, yeah. Yeah. or you could just stumble on it. And it is neat to hear, you know, the traffic reports or the Yankees broadcast or whatever. So well, there's some of us out there who are still like that. I think, yeah. especially yeah. our generation, because we grew up on little transistor AM radios in our pocket yeah. radios. You know, that's that was the thing. Was, there is the commercials. Radio. The commercials we're hearing and the commercials my cousins and friends are hearing on my station when they stream i mean they're not it's not of any benefit to the radio i don't believe we're selling our streaming numbers okay in other words our marketing department is out there selling our broadcasting numbers you know yeah, the, the local they're selling locally but uh obviously we we hear some national commercials but um so it's it's sort of meaningless in terms of financial return but I, that could be changing you know yeah I mean, we have advertising on our apps, so yeah, which are probably demographically. Yeah, or they're usually Stingray uh, properties, so you know, yeah. you get the Stingray app. You know, whatever. Okay. Yeah, it's like watching streaming football. You get the ad from the, the yeah. person that's yeah. actually streaming the ad. You know, so it's a Fox, but it's actually CTV doing it. So you're getting CTV commercials on a Fox right. so. for all the betting apps and the yeah. gaming, exactly, <laughs> which is insane. Yeah. Um, I want to touch on your music. I, I listened to your SoundCloud. Uh, you, you're a funny man. And you, you're also, you have a good production style. Like I, I do, a, I've been doing recording since I'm 16. So you've got some interesting little, uh, so of the way you do stuff. Thank, you got thanks, really Kevin. I'm sorry. I'm cutting you off all the time, man. That's okay. I'm, I'm here to listen. I, uh, that SoundCloud isn't really representative so much because I've done probably a thousand 1200 audio objects and yeah. that's only got fairly recent stuff and really old stuff on there okay. so i've been making my little songs uh since about 1989 90 mm -hmm. uh and initially i mean the production quality was terrible i was going cassette deck to cassette deck with a mixer so recording mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. yeah. putting it back on the next cassette and adding something else mm -hmm. and then that switched to a, a reel to reel and then i my friend's porta studio and it gradually got better over the years and i went to adobe audition at some point to uh it was called cool edit pro back then but that's how i was making my music for the longest time but thank you yeah I, it was always just for myself there's never been any like i'd like to be a good songwriter and i think i've gotten some good little pieces but yeah you're you know, i've never had illusions you know i've never had illusions. technology wasn't 100 percent. your structure's there you're you're the way you put things together is still trying but you have yeah. I, terrible mixers I'm a yeah. terrible mixer sometimes. Anyway, well, I think you did a good job on most of that stuff. What was the song or piece or the thing that stuck out to you? Uh, there was one about, was it a bus? Or uh, 
I have such a horrible memory for names of songs and stuff. That's all right. No, it's you, you knew that. Uh, anyway. I, I, I listened to maybe about half a dozen, no, yeah. to a dozen uh, snippets. And I like the fact that you call them snippets because on my yeah. SoundCloud, I call it audio diary. Okay, well, there you go. How sure. I feel that day, I compose a song. I upload, yeah. You know? But um, so I, I, what was your favorite concert? Because you've you've probably seen a lot of concerts, being a big music fan, and I know we talked about music a little bit in a pre-interview. And you, what's your most memorable and favorite concert that you saw? You know, there's been so many over the years, and yeah. I guess at one point I, I did used to save the subs, the stubs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I stopped doing that a long time. Ago. I don't really have a favorite dude. I haven't, you know, I've, I've seen so many, uh, I've enjoyed the, I'll tell you what the ones I've enjoyed had. Um, when I was in Oshawa, we had the, the local, uh, arena tribute community center. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if that's still the name, but it was, you know, a five, 6,000 seater where the Oshawa generals, the OHL team played. Uh, and those shows were great when we pre- present a major, uh, Nashville act there because uh, we'd get to hang with them and be backstage and drink for free. And Jen and I lived like a 10 minute walk from the place. So I made it sound like I drink a lot. I don't really, but, but it, you know, <laughs> if I wasn't emceeing, I might have a few drinks before the show with Dirk Bentley, you know, that'd be kind of cool. Yeah. Um, so those shows were great. And usually we were presenting them. So one of us would be on stage, sometimes me to emcee it, mm-hmm. uh, which is always fun. Uh, and we were a very popular radio station in town. So, uh, that was kind of cool. Those shows were good. Uh, I enjoyed the Havelock Jamboree outdoor festivals, uh, years ago, 20 years or so ago, we, we went probably 2001 till about 2008 or so 2009, maybe and those were summertime festivals out in the country in Ontario, um, with a lot of older country acts, which I liked, uh, and a lot of Canadian acts and, a lot of cover bands and uh, but it was an outdoor camping kind of thing and it was fun i enjoyed those my early shows in montreal at the forum not so much at olympic stadium but at, at the montreal forum were great yeah. the festival de Tay was probably fabulous and mostly because of that brad paisley story yeah uh and the neil finn show um we were down front for neil finn and it was the summer of 2016 and he's up there doing don't dream it's over and everybody's singing along and uh he he had the crowd in the palm of his hand, and it's the summer before Trump got elected. But he was the nominee at that point because it was July, I think. And uh, he he said they'll come to build a wall between us. We won't let them win. Is how the lyric goes in the song. And the crowd goes, ah! and Neil Finn says, "Do you hear that, Mister Trump?" And the crowd went even wilder. It was something else. Um, so that was a kind of a cool moment uh, down there. And you can see a video of that, by the way, on YouTube. If you search out Neil Finn at the Festival de Tay, and you right. can see the back of my head and me raising a beer when he says that, because somebody <laughs> behind me is videotaping the show and singing along really loudly with a French Canadian accent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so that was that was a great moment, you know. So th- there's been a lot of those. Um, so I don't know if I have a favorite. Uh, th- there's a great venue here in Fredericton called the Playhouse. Uh, mm-hmm. They're replacing it. They're building a new one. Uh, but it's a smallish kind of uh, theater, a soft theater. And uh, I saw Ron Sexsmith there uh, my first month living here, which was great. Again, so lucky. And I got those tickets for free, too. So that was nice. Getting free tickets, you know. Free tickets. That must be awesome. Yeah. Uh, Rufus Wainwright in Toronto. I'd never. My friend liked Rufus Wainwright. I'd never heard of him. We went to the show. I became a fan that night. He was so good. So uh, I'll remember that. That was at RPM in Toronto, the old RPM. I'm looking at your guitars and it's reminding me of one of the songs I heard. Like I said, don't ask me the names of them because I'm horrible with that. I don't even remember half the names. You're talking about the YouTube songs, though? Did you like anything on the YouTube? Yes, I did. uh, Some of it was was uh <laughs> interesting i like it but the guitars in the room by remind me of there's one song you did on soundcloud where you play wawa on the oh, yeah. part and one that of the instrumentals and and you 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 you're a good guitarist i mean you, no you, that's you, that is a uh an effect on the r16 the zoom r16 digital recorder i have yeah that wawa effect that's not me with my foot on a pedal no that but is, the playing is good i mean you play eh. well on that song no you're you're actually a good guitarist and I, eh. so tell me about your guitar playing like is that a passion of yours do you so play here, a lot? Here's, 
I'll try to, and you, you get me to Reader's Digest if you need to, because I'm going to start rambling, I'm sure. Ramble the Mississauga want. train derailment of November 1979, mm -hmm. the largest peacetime evacuation of Canadians ever mm -hmm. because of uh, this uh, rail, uh, railway explosion, uh, like 70 cars that had all kinds of, um, it had the potential to be a lac magantique, actually. Really? Uh, and it probably would have been, a lot, I don't want to say a lot worse, but in terms of um, numbers lost and God bless those poor people in Megantic. That mm -hmm. uh, story has gripped me. Anyway, another time. So that was November 79. I was 16. My brother was already playing guitar. He had a, a Les Paul copy, a Black Beauty, and I'd pick that up once in a while, but I couldn't do shit. So I, uh, we were evacuated to Oakville to my parents' friends, the Gordons, and we stayed there for a week while Mississauga was made safe. And then we all moved back home. There's no school. It was great. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's when I started playing my brother's guitar a little more. Um, and I, he had these fake books, uh, Steely Dan and a Beatles fake book. And that's how I kind of learned uh, what chords were. And I was trying to... But when my friends started, and I got musical, but I wasn't very good, but my friends started putting bands together, and I decided to start playing bass, and I got myself a nice bass and a cheap amp, and I started playing with this band, and then another band, and I became a bass player, and I, I think over the years, I think hopefully a, a better one. Uh, and I know I've gotten better on guitar just because I bought those electrics, because I was on an acoustic for the longest time. Well, your and, acoustic playing on that song, introducing yourself to uh, your new job, was was nice. It was. Oh, just thank you. Really that was well, the, yeah, the the stick song. Some people, you know, when they play yeah. acoustic, you can tell they're not really guitarists. You're, they're no, just, I'm you, you my acoustic. Good. It was nice. Kevin, no, my acoustic playing is like somebody falling out of a tree. I I pluck strum. I can't finger prick. It is. It's it's uh, rough, but it's ready. You know what I mean? It's me. Mark Knopfler said, cool, you can consider yourself a musician if your mother can recognize you playing on the radio or playing anywhere. Yeah. And I think I have my own style. It's kind of a lazy pluck strum mm -hmm. and my timing can be off sometimes, but whatever. It's I'm a campfire. I player. don't consider myself a musician either. I consider myself more of an artist. I When I play with other musicians, I don't know the lingo. I don't know the names of the scales I'm playing. I don't know the names of the chords I'm playing, but I learned them all on my own by I ear think, and by watching people play. That's it. I'm not a musician. I'm, I don't know anything about theory. I can't read. I can't write. Uh -huh. But I play what I feel and I feel what I play, you know, and right. that's, uh, that's, that's, I think that's more important than anything else. And I think I hear that in your music that I heard. The thing to do is to play with people who are better than you. Don't Always. play with people who are worse than you mm -hmm. because they're, if you can help it, I mean, it's nice to show people things, but you won't learn anything from them. I agree. I tried jamming with a guy on piano and he was a decent piano player, but he was the kind of guy he'd play the piece and then he'd stop until he got to the right next note. Oh yeah. So, you know, yeah. because he, he didn't want to just play and keep the rhythm. He wanted to get the notes right. And that's impossible to jam with, especially yeah. if you're a bass or a guitar player. Yeah. So that would drive me nuts. But if I'm playing with somebody who's better, I, like you say, I can watch them and pick up things and, Maybe I believe there's no such thing as a wrong note. It's only the note leading you to the next note. Oh, yeah. Or the one it's a lead it. And if you do it three times in a row, it's like you yeah. meant it. See, I'm not a piano player or a keyboard player by any means, but I've used them in my songs. Uh, and there's a piece, a piece. It sounds so pretentious. Mm -hmm. There's a bit on, um, I think on the SoundCloud, I think it's out there called uh, Restless Lapels. And it came from, you know, you do this and you shift your lapels. Right? Rest. Yeah, yeah. But it's me trying to play jazz piano. And the rhythm track is basically, it's that kind of keyboard where you can hit one note and it'll go. Ba -da, ba -da, ba -da. Yeah. Well, mine does And that. then you hit another one and it changes the key or the, the note. Yeah. And then I'm playing an actual piano solo on top of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a piano player. And it's got exactly those things you mentioned. There's off notes that make sense because of the next one. That's right. I just hold That's it true. longer than I would if I made a mistake. A mistake would sound like, nah, nah. But on purpose would be, nah, you know, whatever. Yeah. I, I think bad notes just make you sound like a jazz player. <laughs> <laughs> Do you watch The Office? Yeah. The, my and, dog got me into that. Oh, my Angela God. Martin. That is so funny. Jazz is stupid. Just play the right notes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, that's a great show. That's a show I missed when it came out because I'm not a big TV watcher. Actually, yeah. I haven't had cable in eight years. I, I started I, watching it because of Jenna Fisher. 
Yeah. I saw Jenna Fisher in Blades of Glory. Yeah. And I thought, oh, that's the cute receptionist from The Office. Maybe I'll give The Office another try because I couldn't stand it at first. Steve Carell's character, just, you know, the, the awkwardness. Yeah, just yeah. I wasn't into that kind of show. Yeah. But it took a crush on uh, Pam Beasley and Jenna Fisher to uh, get me to start watching it. There you go. Anyway. That's fun. That's yeah. fun. Well, you know, it's uh, music is I I, um, I love music and watching your three guitars just I make begs me to ask what kind of guitars you got back there. They're all copies. They're well, all copies. Fine. I build uh, my own. and I have copies, too. I have a Fender. Um, it's the, the teleacoustic. It's a teleacoustic. It's before the newer ones they brought out. These ones came out in the early 2000s. It's okay. got active electronics, but it's got really high action. That one is at my office. I keep that one in my studio in case I'm inspired. Sometimes I'll do a little song on the air. Very rarely. That's cool. What's your favorite guitar of those three? Uh, those three. And I, I was going to tell you about them. So yeah. on the, the last Paul uh, Jr., is an Epiphone, and I got that for $150 from a friend of mine, actually, who had it for sale. Got the same one. Yeah. I don't like it as much. That one, currently, I took off the bottom E string, and I tuned it Keith Richards style, the open G. Yeah, yeah. To, cool. Just to play the Stone songs, but I haven't played it in so long. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, the open, the bottom E string would buzz a little because it is, you know, the guitar yeah. could probably use a, a fix I like up. the gain on that guitar when you... Yes, the pickups sound great. Yeah. Uh, the one in the middle is... a. I bought that was a new Squire Telecaster, nice. uh, the Affinity Tele. It was 300 bucks five, six years ago. Uh, I always saw myself as a Tele guy because all my favorite players played them yeah. and they were the new wave guitar of the early 80s that I liked. But uh, I don't like that one. It turned out I loved the Strat and the Strat was the first of the three I got, the blue thing. I do want to uh, strip it and, and repaint it though. I don't like the if color. I can interject the Tele. I never played a telly until I got the Jimmy Page Dragon telly. Uh, wow. Production. Are you rich? No, it was only $2,000. I mean, oh, not that that's, I, I'm, that's the most I ever spent on a guitar. Okay. But Is I, that I, the I, one with the mirrors? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, I didn't put the mirrors on it. I, yeah. I took off the the, 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 the mirror behind the, the plexiglass. Yeah. You left uh, the dragon. Yeah, just the dragon. And yeah. I never played a tail, a tell, or never liked tellies before that. I love that guitar. See, that and I so like the sound of the telly, but this one, uh, the weight is off. I don't like, okay. maybe I could get a different strap, but I don't, you know, it yeah. just doesn't play as well. The next little while, the strat is so playable and I never saw myself fun. as a strat guy and yeah. I love, it's got the exact bell tone that a real Fender Stratocaster would have. Yeah. Uh, and it, I think that one cost me 125. That's so the middle of the telly brand new from Squire mm -hmm. was the most expensive of those three. Yeah. I, I yeah. built a strat style. Let's see. This is uh this is one that I built and it has a beautiful it's a seven way position with the Oh god. Let me can I see the headstock? Yeah, sure. It's a rosewood. Yeah. Nice. Beautiful. That's my branding marks. <laughs> I would love to refinish that blue strat. I hate the blue. I want to make it natural. My buddy had a a, a maple walnut strat way back when. This is my current favorite player, 2 P90s on a strat style. Is that a Gode? No, it's my own. It's, it's, oh, okay. uh, it's another marks. Okay. You can Sweet. see it there. So this one has a seven-way switch, a, a five, a, sorry, a five-way switch on two pickups. And are you building the wood from scratch, or are you taking no. existing ones and putting necks on? And I buy everything raw, and I, I finish it and customize it myself. Okay. All right. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, I, I I've I found a love for tellies after I yeah. bought got that Jimmy Page telly and uh, Strat styles. I I built this Strat style because I like the fact that I can combine the the, the pickups in a different way. It's a seven yeah. switch instead of a five way switch. Which... Well, I'm gonna take that telly back to Long and McQuaid and trade it uh, for a mic or something. I'm I'm gonna do that and I'm gonna refinish that Strat. That's one of my projects I got coming up. I'm not even sure how to do it. I'm gonna have to look it up online. That's I want to sand all that program. blue off. And I want to make it natural. So what dark, natural, light, natural. Uh, I don't know. It's a, maybe it's even fun, green. It's a fun part of the surf guitar green. Though. Maybe surf. Oh, that is a cool, you know, green, natural stain is beautiful. Yeah. Or if I wanted it like my heroes, the Beatles, mm -hmm. um, I could do it in uh, what was the blue that George and John's twin strats were. They played them on ticket to ride and uh, nowhere, man. Uh, Sonic blue. 
Sonic blue. And it's, and it's a little like the color on my wall behind me, but it's lighter. Mm-hmm. Anyway, beautiful. One guitar color I want to get one day, and I've got 17 guitars, so I don't really need another one. So people tell me, why do you need so many guitars? They have different tone. Yeah. But- a, a guitar color that I would really love, and it would be a stra- I mean, a telly, would be TV yellow. Yes, TV yellow. So that's the yeah. the, the junior that they had that in the longest time, and yeah. of course that's called that because the color came on a black and white TV was very bright and nice. Yeah, the yellow looked you know like a good white on TV. Yeah, yeah, that's no, that's it's, it's a cool color. Would you ever buy a relic guitar? No, but I kind of relic. I, I I don't call it relicking. I call it rustic. My guitars yeah. have a rustic look. Yeah, throw me that strat again because you had that on that. Yeah, th- th- this has a rustic look to See, it. See, that looks like a '63 because that that's the way well, they made it on the side. I did all yeah. this myself, you know. Yeah, uh, it's all See, sad. that's another thing. My telly doesn't have any scalloping, and the strat just feels so good in my arms. I never thought I'd be a strat guy, but I love it. I, I'm I, I'm originally a Les Paul guy. I've got a '74 Les Paul Custom that I bought in '86 for 600 bucks with an amplifier. Yeah. Now it's worth like four thousand dollars just because everybody wow. wants a relic Les Paul, and mine is naturally relic. Mm-hmm. Uh, the guy who had it before me toured Europe, and his belt, his '70s belt buckle, grooved the. Uh, uh, yeah. gash inside the back of it yeah. so i played that for most of my life and then my friend gave me an ibanez uh, strat style uh, blazer a red one i'd show it to you but it's too far uh that became my favorite guitar for the longest time because of the whammy bar on it it just allowed yeah. me to open up my playing yeah. but then i fell in love with the telly and then i have these two that i built so my main arsenal is the les paul the the ibanez the the Jimmy Page Telecaster and uh, the two ones that I made. Yeah. I made more than two, but those are my favorite two that I made. What kind of amp you got down there? I know it's a Fender, but what one is? I got it with the Strat, actually, a front man. A front man, yeah, yeah. I just want to show you one thing, because I'm not a lead guitar player. And even when I get on the electric, I tend to bash it like the acoustic. I have to remember to. To come back a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I don't even think I'm in tune. Close enough. But I Close like enough. This. We were talking about the Strat mm-hmm. uh, and uh, John and George's Strats that were twin 63 Stratocaster Sonic Blue. And they went out and got them and they used them on Nowhere Man. Yeah. And they they wanted it really trebly. So they mm-hmm. kept making it treblier. And then they fed it through the board a few times. Yeah. And my one of my favorite free song moments, one of my goosebump moments for a Beatles song is... Uh, oh, that's loud. Sorry. <laughs> it's not even in tune and I wanted to do it. <laughs> Hang on. Oh, I can't do it now. <laughs> a great chord progression and just edit great, like, that whole thing out edit that whole thing out but that's one of those moments and it took me years to learn that and i just played it probably the crappiest i've ever played but it was but good because it was raw I, I'm, yeah, I'm raw ding, ding, like that. you listen to that you know and that that's turned out to be one of my favorite uh lennon beatles songs yeah it, it is one of their best songs he was writing about himself you know yeah anyway i'm sorry i just had to do that we were talking about that we were talking about the strat and it wasn't even in tune. And well, that's a great know. moment for podcasting, so don't be no, embarrassed. I, I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> that's what I like about podcasting is because it's raw. And people like these kind of moments, to be honest with you, because yeah. it's natural. You know, it's not scripted, so. it's not I'm, polished, you know, so. I I think I'm I'll always. the actual video at the, when it's done before I post it, and you can tell me if I have to cut it out or not. That's fine. Whatever you like, buddy. I don't care. Um, but I've always seen myself. You know, I like to play music. I like to play music on instruments. I like to play it on the radio. Mm -hmm. I like to listen to it in my car. Mm -hmm. But my real, I think any skills I have, the top would be as an editor. So that 
yeah involves my music involves my on-air work it's mm. about making things concise yeah and i can ramble with the best of them and sure podcasting is a great rambling outlet you know yeah. years ago people would write a book instead now they're doing a podcast and that's fine exactly. um but i've always been more of a a produced sort of guy if i'm putting something out there mm. it's at least got to be tight you know what i mean yeah i guess so that. not too much like if i find myself rambling on the air i just you know morgan wallen coming up you know boom your rambling commercial. so far has been very entertaining and fun to listen yeah to. Don't, yeah don't, well, that's because it's saturday much. and i'm at home it's not yeah. you know i Monday. started recording with with a, a small piano key tape deck you know those they're, they're the sears yeah there. yeah oh i, I had to record my family those. talking around the kitchen table back in yeah. the 70s yeah then when i, I started playing those. guitar i got myself a double cassette uh, ghetto blaster yeah and it had an overdub feature so oh I excellent overdub that until it sounded like love it do you know those old piano uh key uh my yeah. brother discovered you could take a piece of paper and put it over the record head some of them had separate record play heads back then that's right you could put a piece of paper and stick it in there while you're recording and hear your first track and kind of you know anyway that's cool Sorry. yeah then, cool. then i got myself a fostex 480 so that mm -hmm. that was a big you know four track thing so i've been yep. recording and i now master my own music like i used to try and do it you know with software i enjoy the mastering i enjoy the the editing, editing. i enjoy i love producing yeah so i understand what you're saying about that i mean i as much as i love to play i love putting it all together and stereo yeah. getting the right you know balance between left and right for the guitar solo and the yeah. and the vocal blending and all i just love that part of it it's just fantastic and doing the podcast is a little more simple because it's more raw but I do mm -hmm. edit my intro and my outro and I do mm -hmm. do multiple cameras like now we're doing a zoom call so it's, there's no editing really it's just basically right fix the sound and the, the video quality and that's it but when i do uh face-to-face -face interviews in my house i have the two cameras so i edit back and forth who's speaking and who's getting reactions and i just love doing that i think that's it's it's an extension of creativity you know all right that's all it's all good well, on that note, I think uh, this has been a great conversation. And uh, I know you said you wanted to limit it to an hour, and this is pretty much an hour now. And I know you got stuff to do, but I really enjoyed your conversation. I think you're very, very talented as far as your your, your stories and your storytelling and everything. And uh, even your little guitar playing in those in tune. Nah, edit cool. that out. That's a hard song to play anyway. So No, but I can play it standing up in, in an on-tune guitar. And exactly. it just, you know, I'm, cool. I'm feeling very, uh, uh, you know, just it was a whim spur of the moment thing well whims are cool. talking about the song like whims on this podcast yeah <laughs> yeah so i really enjoyed talking to you and it's been great and i hope we can keep in touch and uh maybe you know do this again sometime if you have something yeah. you want to promote or something. anytime yeah. kevin yeah and it, it, we can talk about other stuff too it doesn't exactly you know. i mean you are an interesting person you've lived a, a life like we both have we're at an age where we've Done a lot of things yeah and i'm sure as your storytelling skills are so uh, acute then you're going to have some great stories to tell us i don't so know about that but thank you back on another time thank you i, I invite, invite embarrass you with the great i just found that it was you you have a lot of talent and you got a lot of stuff going on and and you you're up there and as far as you know interesting people so i can I yeah can, I could be an asshole though, but I'm not. Well, I, me too. I that's what I said, it. like at the start. It, I it's got more two ex-wives. I'll tell you that you're right. I'm <laughs> an asshole too. <laughs> I'm just trying to be a good person first and foremost. You know, any acclaim or or uh, reputation <laughs> or uh, stuff in the industry that I may have, you know, that's great. But it's you know icing on the cake. We yeah. we live in a, a beautiful home out here in a beautiful city. Uh, as soon as spring gets here and it's a springy day today here in Fredericton, awesome. uh, it's, you know, we have the, we, we ride our bikes. We love it. We're yeah. both uh, big brothers, big sisters. Now we're involved with them. We have a little together awesome. We're sharing as a couple. I'm yeah. doing work with the Alzheimer's society here in New Brunswick oh, on the board. Uh, we're getting our walk for Alzheimer's at the end of May organized. Now my mother uh, had Alzheimer's before. Yeah. She See my mother, my grandmother, a couple of my aunts. It's been well. very close anyway. Uh, so there's that. And just, trying to get integrated into the community and 
uh, uh, Frederick the sends the craft podcast is your your endeavors in the in the community and all that stuff. I mean, I'm open. Like this show is about anything and everything. There is no subject yeah. in the show. That and that's what I'm aiming for. It's very it's 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 in its incubus stage. But yeah. my goal is to talk about anything and everything with whoever out there that I find interesting, and I find you interesting. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for so I I will invite you back. This yeah. is a formal invitation. Okay. And I will Anytime. say to everybody, thank you for joining us and be nice to somebody because it makes you feel good and it makes them feel good. Have a great day and signing out. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin.